Welcome to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. I am here with Justin Dean. He's an entrepreneur and founder of the Sunday Group, which helps churches thrive from Sunday to Sunday. He's also served as a communications director at Mars Hill Church in Seattle, and he has his hands on a lot of different things. He also lives in Atlanta, Georgia with his wife and four kids. Welcome to the show, Justin. How are you? Hey, Tim. It is a pleasure to be here, man. Thanks for asking me on. Yeah, absolutely. We were just talking, man, how like, you know, how connected we seem to be, even though we've never actually met. And it's like every person that I connect with on Facebook seems to be connected with you. It's crazy. <laughs> it's definitely a small world of uh, Christians and, uh, you know, actually being active on social media. <laughs> well, that's good, man. We got to stick together. Yeah, true. So tell us uh, anything else about yourself. You want to share any personal information? Oh, sure. Yeah. Like social security number or what do you need? <laughs> well, that's, that's off, off, off air. I'll ask for that later. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Follow. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, you know, like I said, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I've kind of been all over the place. I, I grew up in Southern California and then uh, somehow made it over here and uh, had a little stint for uh, five years or so in uh, Seattle when I was working at Mars Hill and um I don't know. I got four kids, been married uh, 15 years coming up uh, like next week, uh, which is pretty exciting and uh, looking forward to celebrating that. Got a wonderful wife, uh, great kids. We homeschool um, all four of them or really my wife does. And uh, I work from home. I, you know, I run a company called uh, the Sunday group, which does a lot of different things. We have a annual conference for church communicators, uh, which we just did our sixth annual conference and it was entirely online, Nice, which was uh, a new experience, but it went really well. I mean, over 10,000 people watched it, which was uh, wow. mind boggling, um, but very, very exciting uh, to see the growth in that. And um, then we've got a number of uh, like, uh, you know, membership sites, subscriptions that you can subscribe to online that uh, we help resource churches with uh, practical resources that help them uh, really engage people, uh, we say, from Sunday to Sunday. So we help a lot with Sunday mornings as well, but we, we feel like that's one aspect of, uh, of doing church and making disciples and that there's so much more opportunity uh, throughout the week. And so we, we focus a lot on that. What type of resources do you provide? So a lot of it's like highly practical stuff. So uh, like through Courageous Storytellers is a membership site that we run, CourageousStorytellers.com. And uh, it's like 29 bucks a month. And we provide everything from social media images to like sermon design kits. So you can, you can have graphical designs around a, you know, a sermon series or book of the Bible or whatever you're doing. And, uh, and then on top of that, we really, we listen to the audience and uh, or to our, to our customers and uh, and what's out there, and we try to create things that take things off of their plate. So mm. uh, you know, we've had people come to us and say, "Hey, you know, our pastor's writing a book for the first time. We've never done this. Like, how do we how do we market a book as a church, and how do we keep that separate and all the nuances that go along with that?" And so we just you know literally just provide a full marketing plan for a book and say, "Here you go. Here's the template. You know, work off of this." And then others can use it as well. Uh, and so just tons of documents, templates, guides, ebooks, things like that, that uh, help them do their jobs better. But really the idea is to take things off of their plate because churches are kind of understaffed and under-resourced and uh, still got to do, do a lot. So we try to help as much as we can. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's a wide range of churches, you know, some that were the pastor still has to do a, maybe a second job and they just want to yep. kind of make their life a little easier. And then bigger churches that just kind of want to streamline a few things without having to do everything. So you can kind of piecemeal it, right? Yeah, for sure. And uh, we've got our audience, you know, is a wide range uh, within there. We've got a lot of pastors who are, who are doing everything themselves, a lot of church planners. Uh, and then we've got, you know, churches that have full on teams, uh, but they still need, you know, some, some support. Um, I mean, churches are kind of all over the spectrum on that stuff. That's really cool. Especially the churches don't feel like they're on an Island to themselves, that there's networks and connections that they can be, that can be made, you know, so, um, that there is that level of support. That's awesome. Yeah, for sure. And I was going to say too, I've been married 15 years and we homeschool as well. So we have a connection wow. right there too. That's awesome. Copycat, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love I'll it. Have to see who did it first. And then we'll... how many kids you got? Two kids. 
11 okay. and 6, boy and a girl. All right, you got a little catching up to do. Yeah, right. Well, we're done. <laughs> we're done, but, you know. <laughs> All right, fair enough. So, um, so cool, man. So a couple icebreakers for you. I have to ask everybody this. So what is your favorite movie of all time? So, uh, I mean, I love movies. Like if I, if I sit down and watch a movie, it's going to be like, uh, just dumb action stuff. I mean, I'm a big, like, you know, Jason Bourne, uh, type of movies. And so that's, that's typically what I watch, but honestly, like one of my favorite movies besides the obvious, like, you know, Braveheart and, and movies like that, which is definitely my top five, but uh, I love the movie Magnolia. Like it's, it's a movie that most people have never heard of, but it's got a ton of actors in it. I mean, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Tom Cruise. Mm. Uh, I don't know. It's just, it's just one that makes me feel like every kind of emotion when I watch it. And mm. so uh, I like movies that do that. Is that the one with the frogs at the end, raining frogs? It is, yeah. Oh, yeah, my don't goodness. Don't spoil it, man. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, I saw it once, and I have no idea what that meant. And I think Honestly, I just kind of gave like, up on it. There's been all these blog posts and stuff about it. Like, mm. there are so many biblical themes throughout that movie, which makes it even better. Interesting. Uh, like, the frog thing is is from the Bible. So yeah. Definitely okay. something to look at. Huh. I have to look at it in a new light now. Yeah. So, you've met some famous people, but if you could meet anyone you have not met, who, who would it be in Alive or Dead? Alive or dead, anyone, I should have thought of this beforehand considering you sent me these uh, questions, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I would love to meet, uh, like, you know, Ronald Reagan, mm. uh, Abe Lincoln. I mean, guys, guys like that that really helped frame our country yeah. uh, as we know it. And, uh, I mean, we grew up, I was born in 82, Reagan was president throughout my early early childhood didn't even know what that meant at that time but yeah. growing up it was like um you know my dad had a lot of respect for for reagan and um it just kind of i don't know framed our uh political beliefs and things like that and so uh and i've had an opportunity to um to go to you know some events at the white house with with trump and stuff and so it'd be really interesting to just kind of go back and uh, and meet him as well but I don't know. That's the first thing that came up. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I saw the I saw the pictures of that event, and I was like, man, that's that's so awesome that you could all go. I mean, I say you all because I looked at a few people on there. I'm like, oh, that's I know yeah, yeah. I kind of know those people from this podcast. Matt Brown, yeah. John Groves, a couple other people I want to have Groves, on. Awesome, Malachi yeah. O'Brien. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been fortunate enough to to be part of this kind of coalition, uh, Evangelicals for Trump. Which I mean, the whole the whole goal of it is to get Christians and churches on board with. Um, uh, helping reelect Trump. And um, I mean, I don't want to turn this into anything political and people yeah, yeah. are on the spectrum of course of political views, but, uh, but I, I support Trump and, and we'll vote for him again. And I uh, think that it's, it's, it's incredible how he has invited so many Christians and evangelicals, whatever you want to call them yeah. uh, into events and stuff like that. So it was definitely, definitely an experience being able to go to the white house and be a part of that. That's so cool. And I'll, Actually, my ulterior motive is to have more people on so I can be a plus one next time. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to invite you into, uh, into the group. But uh, awesome. the White House invites seem to be very uh, invite only. I don't know. Yeah, who yeah, yeah. Makes those choices. <laughs> yeah. I'll just invite everyone at the White House to come on the podcast. Just and... show up. I think yeah. be fun. Just show up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Last uh, icebreaker question for you. Favorite author of yours or a book you would recommend to the audience? So I do, I, I read a lot of like uh, business books. I mean, Tim Ferriss uh, is one that comes to mind, Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, that's mainly what I've read. Like, uh, uh, and it's, these days it's really just, I'll pick up tons of books like that and I'll just kind of skim through them and get the big idea. Mm. I honestly don't do a, a lot of reading these days. Uh, I do a lot of reading online. I'll find myself doing blog posts and articles and uh, podcasts and stuff like crazy yeah, uh, but it's been a long time since I've actually like invested in reading a book. And that's kind of like not the norm anymore. Everyone's like, you know, leaders are readers. And I just don't <laughs> uh, I don't believe it. I, I think it can be I don't believe in that. Yeah. Somewhat of a of a time waste. But my wife's really into novels and stuff. I guess she does a ton of reading and our kids yeah. do, too. But I just to me, it's always like, man, I got I got better things to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, my wife is a huge reader and and 
up until this year, I would, I would probably read one book every two years. It felt like, and yeah, I've been more intentional this year. Uh, I try to incorporate books with my like daily devotions. And so I've gotten through a good amount this year so far, but yeah. it's still something that I kind of have to force myself to do. And I'm also getting a ton of books either sent to me or that I've been oh, reading yeah. based on, you know, guests that I've had on. And so, yeah. Um, I will say I, I have uh, I have read the Volunteer Effect by my mm. friend Jonathan Malm and Jason Young. They, you know, people do they send me their books and yeah. uh, you know whether they just want to gift them to me or, or want an endorsement. And so I'll yeah. I'll read them if they're from friends. But uh, hey, Malm and bookshelf and, Young, and it looks uh, it looks like you're you know super knowledgeable on all this info. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um, so I ask all my guests about discernment. Uh, which is the topic of our show and just a time in your life when you had godly discernment, there was a direction, you know, that you were leading or a decision that you had to make and, and kind of what that looked like and how you knew how to make the decision. And then also a time where you had a similar decision to make, and maybe you made the wrong decision and in hindsight, kind of what you learned from it. So yeah. either which one of those you want to start with and just kind of tell us that story. Sure. Uh, I'll start with, with the time I had uh, good discernment, I guess, and then we'll, we'll go into the other Sure. Uh, that'll be more fun but um I, you know a number of things have come to mind where i've actually you know sat down prayed about it taken the time fasted even at times to to make big decisions um and really tune in and listen to to god's discernment and so um you know the the big one that comes to mind is is marrying my wife um the you know that was probably one of the first biggest decisions where it was like I gotta think this through and uh you know we were dating for a while and uh um you know my family was like this is the one you should marry her and uh and so it kind of sparked that okay wow this is this might actually you know be something real that I should think through and uh and so you know took took time praying and it was kind of one of those things where it's like I wanted to, to do it. I, I had the decision made, but it was like, this is such a major decision. Uh, let's make sure, <laughs> you know, that oh, yeah. doing this right. And, um, and it's, you know, with those things, it is kind of the approach I usually take uh, is if it's something that I want to do and I, and I know um, that it, that it feels right. I take the time and ask God, okay, like if this is your will, if this is from you, you know, keep this feeling going, keep, make it stronger and just make yeah. it clear to me that this is the direction to go to or change my mind and, and change my feelings about it. And it's, it's so hard in those decisions to, to make logical decisions and not really base things off of your feelings, especially when it comes to love and marriage and stuff yeah. like that. But uh, um, you know, it just, it just seemed like one of those things that was very, very clear and uh, from God um mm-hmm. even though we were just young and uh kind of dumb and uh over the 15 <laughs> years i mean we've we've both made you know a ton of mistakes and struggled through a lot of stuff uh in our marriage that god has uh redeemed but i, mm-hmm. I feel like from the very beginning god was very much uh, a part of that and you know uh, throughout our marriage too we've had to make huge decisions uh you know we were married here in atlanta had lived here for uh, gosh, four or five years, I don't know, maybe even longer before um, a company I was working for. Um, uh, I was working here in Atlanta, they were based in Seattle. And uh, we were trying to sell the company. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was running marketing as vice president of marketing for the company. And so uh, the offer was made to us, hey, you know, we want you to go live in Seattle, help us sell the company. Um and it'll be like a six month stint and then, you know, you can come back. And it was one of those things where it was like, man, we, you know, we had one kid at the time. Uh, we had just bought a home here in Atlanta and uh, it was such a, a major decision um, that, uh, you know, I approached my wife with and I was just like, hey, this is the opportunity uh, to be a lot of money. It'll be a fun adventure. It'll be six months and we'll be back. And um uh, it was one of those things where I wasn't going to make that major of a decision, though, 
um, without like bolting up both of us being in agreement. And I think that's, what's great with having, having a marriage, having someone, uh, you know, to partner with on stuff like that is, is we can both say, okay, let's both go pray yeah. separately about this for a while and come back. And, uh, if God's speaking to both of us in the same way, then that's uh, a good way that we've always kind of, um, made big decisions like that is, is, uh, we, you know, if God's in it, chances are we're both going to be pretty aligned with that. Mm. Um, and we're a pretty traditional marriage. I mean, when it comes to decision-making, uh, you know, I, I, as a leader of the family, uh, have the burden of, of making those final decisions sometimes, but I don't, I don't think there's ever been a, a situation where my wife's saying, no, don't do this. And I'm saying, yeah, we're going to do it. Like, yeah, nothing major i wouldn't think but um i think that the god works that way in marriages to say now you're, you're both going to be on board with this so you know we made that move to seattle uh sold that company and uh uh when it was sold uh we realized how in depth god actually was part of that because we were we had gotten so plugged into uh, marcel church out there we're leading a community group and stuff so uh, it actually took a year to sell that company. So we were out there for a year <laughs> and uh, when it sold, uh, you know, they were ready to move us back to uh, Atlanta or actually the company that bought them was, was in Raleigh, North Carolina that we had, they had an incredible offer for me to go work for them there. And uh, um, we just decided, you know, we love Seattle so much. We love Marshall so much that we stuck around yeah. And obviously I, I uh, ended up working at the church and making a, a huge major life decision uh, again there. Mm. Th that was pretty uh, incredible. But uh, looking back, we realized, man, God had orchestrated that entire uh, thing uh, for me to go into ministry and, and kind of spark that, which is really um, everything else has kind of, kind of weaned off of that since then. That's cool. And I actually posted about this today. It's funny is, is if we walk in obedience with God, we can trust him, even if we don't understand the journey yeah. and we don't necessarily know what the next two steps will look like, but we just have to take the first step in faith and trust that if it's from God, it's going to work yeah. out. It may not be a perfect, you know, stress-free process, but when you look back, like you're saying on the journey you've had with God, making those decisions in obedience, you see his faithfulness every step of the way. And right. that, you know, through the hills and valleys, through the, the questions and, and not knowing what the next step will be necessarily, but okay, what do you have for me in this next moment, in this next decision, God? And it's great that you can be in, you know, we should be in collabor collaboration with our spouse that so we, we both hear from God. We both are in agreement about, especially the major decisions, you know, there's sometimes when uh, smaller decisions, you may not be in complete agreement on, and that's okay. But right. the, the big decisions, you definitely don't want to push your will upon the other person if you're both not in agreement and a lot of times that peace comes from god where we have peace about this decision even it might be crazy to someone else you know us both having peace about it is going to make the difference because you know god is a god of of peace and out of chaos and and so a lot of times discernment comes just out of that peace yeah yeah. And, you know, in that situation, it was one of those things where we really didn't know what we were doing or why it was like, okay, well, you know, at least this is temporary. Let's go do it. And uh, I mean, it was just the, the greatest adventure of our lives. Really, it really formed what we believe uh, as Christians and, and as a married couple. I mean, we, we grew so much during that season that uh, God was so at hand and in, in everything. And it really couldn't have been done any, any different way. Like had we stayed here in Georgia and not gone uh, on that adventure um, who knows where we'd be, but uh, certainly we were at a time where we were, you know, young, married, had one kid. We really just kind of followed what our, you know, what my family believed as far as Christian beliefs and values. And we were very much uh, just kind of tied to that and, didn't really have room to grow and experience things on our own. And so when we moved to Seattle, I mean, we were literally knew no one out there and we were 3000 miles away from anyone we knew yeah. and had to kind of join, you know, new community with people and uh, hadn't even really heard much about Marcel. It just happened. Someone suggested go to this church because they're, you know, reformed <laughs> and yeah. we had a kind of reformed background, but um, that, uh, that helped shaped kind of who we are today. So wow. Just incredible. It, it, it's always, you know, you always look back and realize 
my gosh, you know, God was so at hand and in, in all of this, mm. even in the bad decisions, uh, even in, in things that happen bad, you, you can look back uh, and see, okay, you know, God redeemed that God had his mm. hand in that, uh, even though I made the, the bad decision. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. And I talk about it as, you know, God's a God of open doors. And so a lot of times the open door looks scary. You don't know how to walk through it. And, you, you know, you don't see on the other side of it. But on the other side of it, if you're obedient to God is is blessing. And a lot of times the blessing is not what we think of. It's just a life of obedience. Like you're saying, you know, you're in a if you if you played it safe, there would have been no condemnation from God. You know, right. God would have still been in your life. You're still a Christian. You're still saved, all those things. But when yeah. you walk in obedience, God will bless that. And he always honors obedience all through the Bible and, and, and today. And yeah. so, you know, the scary decisions are often the ones that will propel us to the best that God has for us and not, you know, I'm, I'm not a risk taker by nature, but you know, when it comes to God, he's, he is, and he loves yeah. to push us in a direction that is not, is out of our comfort zone because he knows all, all paths and patterns and, and possibilities. And so, well, know. and that's where the, that's where this, you know, story comes from. If everything was play it safe and just, you know, follow his clear direction. I mean, there would be no, there would be no conflict and things like that. And that's what draws people to God. I mean, yeah. that, you know, every, everyone's salvation story has some kind of conflict to it, even though like I grew up in the, in the church, but there was still conflict in my life that made me turn to him personally. Um, and I think that that's, um, I think that's just the way he designed the world to work and for us to work, even in the Bible, every, every lesson, um, you know, he taught every question he answered, um, was with a, a story. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he never just yeah. said, okay, here's the answer. It was like, ah, let me tell you a parable about this and this and this, and you know, right. and it makes it lasting, uh, you know, it makes it everlasting and, and, uh, makes it more compelling. I think we're drawn to that. So, uh, I don't know. It makes sense to me. Yeah. That's really good. Is there a time you can share that um, you didn't have wise discernment and kind of what you No, I've it? always had. Okay, moving uh, on. Completely wise. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. No, it's, uh, you know, there's, it, it's funny. I, I've definitely made a lot of bad decisions in my life. Um, but uh, as far as, as uh, an example of just not having good discern, discernment, um, one big one comes to mind. So um, my daughter i got four kids two two boys two girls uh one of my daughters ellie she is seven years old now and uh, she was four um uh, at the time and she was uh it was one that summer uh in june which summers here are pretty pretty hot here in georgia and uh, we were outside a lot and uh, playing outside and stuff like that but for a good i don't know four or five days a, a good week she was just constantly thirsty, always asking for, for more water. Uh, she was going to the bathroom a lot uh, as well and uh, kind of just seemed a little out of it. And uh, to me, I, I kind of chalked it up as like, okay, well, you know, we've been outside every day. Of course, she's thirsty. Of course, she's going to the bathroom a lot, uh, running around and stuff like that. And uh, seemed pretty normal to me. Um, uh, but she was also like, wedding to bed a lot too which was a new thing uh and even that we were just you know or at least i was like man that's just that's just normal kid stuff you know she's just going through something right now maybe she's even sick a little bit um and so my wife who is more of a she worries about kind of every little thing especially when it comes Mm -hmm. to health of the kids and stuff like that her discernment radar was going off, like expecting the worst. She was like, no, this is, this is something bad. There's something going on. Um, and, uh, you know, she was kind of raising all the flags and the alerts and, uh, you know, in my defense a little bit, she, she does that for everything. I mean, any kind of little cold or sniffle or anything, it's like, uh, you know, she's, she's Googling what it could be and, and like, Oh my gosh, it's cancer. Oh yeah. You know, you can't, to everything. Google, you can't Google that. It's everything. Yeah, like cancer. when you Google anything, it's like, it's either not a big deal. It'll go away in a few days or 
rush to the hospital yeah. in a helicopter now. <laughs> <laughs> there's no in between. Yeah. Yeah. There's really no in between. And, it, and that's why every single thing on MDV and M- WebMD says, yeah. uh, consult with your doctor. They're like, just yeah. call a doctor. Why are you here? <laughs> um, and so it's, uh, it, it's just, you know, it's just funny. I mean, that's typical in, in any marriage, but uh, at the time I just was really downplaying. I was like, come on, this is not anything serious. It seems pretty normal. Um, but uh, she had kind of the signs of like a urinary tract infection. So mm-hmm. uh, we made an appointment with our pediatrician. You know, you call in, you make an appointment, it's, it takes a few days, you get an appointment. Um, and so it was like another three days. Uh, we were just going to bring her in thinking for sure this is, uh, you know, UTI or something. We'll, she'll, she'll get some, some meds and, and we'll be good. Uh, so that, uh, that comes around, uh, the night before that appointment, she actually stayed the night at her aunt's, uh, house, her great aunt's house and, uh, had a big spaghetti dinner and, uh, you know, was just feeling like her stomach was really, really hurting mm. that night. And, uh, and, you know, of course my wife was just like, no, this is something bad. And, uh, um, got through that night. Uh, wasn't a great night. She was feeling really bad. My wife took her to the pediatric uh, appointment the next day and uh, was telling her about what's going on, the symptoms and everything. And uh, by just the grace of God, we have, we have an awesome pediatrician. She was like, uh, I kind of have an idea what this might be. Um, didn't, didn't do the UTI uh, test or anything. She was like, let's, let's poke her finger and uh, take her blood sugar and, and just see where that's at. And uh, tested her finger, you know, uh, on a blood meter and her blood sugar, I believe was like 450, something like that, Um, which, uh, you know, typically uh, our bodies will keep our blood sugar at a, at a hundred, 100, 120. Um, And so, uh, you know, turned out she is a a type one diabetic. Mm. And so uh, the pediatrician was like, look, uh, you need to take her to the children's hospital right now like either we can call an ambulance or you can get in your car and drive there now but do not go anywhere else do not stop anywhere go there uh you know right now and uh so my wife's like just completely panicked you know calls me tells me what's going on here's what we're doing and uh takes her to the hospital they diagnosed her right away with, with type 1 diabetes and so you know, for, for anyone who doesn't know, you know, what type one diabetes is, because there's, there's, there's type one, and there's type two, they're actually very extremely different uh, diseases or conditions. But in Ellie's case, uh, her pancreas actually stopped working. So in a type one diabetic, the pancreas just uh, doesn't work anymore. And the pancreas's job is one of the jobs is to create insulin. So anytime you eat sugar, carbs, uh, stuff like that, your body turns that into energy and the insulin is what does that. The the insulin uh, absorbs the the carbs, turns it into energy. So your brain can function. Yeah. And uh, so hers stopped, stopped producing insulin. And that's why your blood sugar was rising and rising. That spaghetti dinner uh, just skyrocketed it. And, uh, and when your body doesn't produce insulin anymore, what it does is starts burning the fat on your body uh, in order to release the insulin that's stored in there uh, to deal with it. But during that process, it actually releases uh, acid into your blood. And uh, Ellie was a good day uh, away, hours away, even um, from having just too much acid in her blood that she would have gone into to what's called DKA. Um, so that's when diabetics go into comas or, uh, you know, or worse. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were 10 or 12 other kids admitted to the children's hospital that day, uh, being diagnosed with type one diabetes. Most of them, uh, were in DKA, like wow. they were rushed to the hospital, passed out. Mm. Uh, so luckily we weren't at that point, but we were literally, you know, hours to a day away from where she would be, uh, at that point, just a very, you know, serious, scary, uh, situation. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a permanent condition to which there's no cure. I mean, her, her body doesn't produce insulin. So we have to inject her with insulin. We have to constantly monitor her blood sugar and, uh, count up the carbs she eats and give her the appropriate amount of insulin for it. I mean, it's, it's been yeah. definitely, uh, an adjustment in our lives over the last three years, but, uh, 
in that moment, uh, you know, I was, I just did not have good discernment with it. I didn't even seek uh, the Lord for help during that time. Uh, and my wife was struggling to uh, follow her gut and, uh, and also be respectful to her husband. Uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, it's just one of those situations where we look back on where, man, I just feel completely horrible. You know, yeah. obviously it was a, a big tension in our marriage because it was, you know, I could have been the cause of, of so much worse, uh, had God not had his hand in that. And, uh, not only the knowledge of our pediatrician, cause we hear stories now of so many kids who have been, uh, misdiagnosed by a pediatrician. Cause generally they might have had a day, uh, of class in medical school about type one diabetes in kids. Mm. Um, but they're not, most pediatricians are not very knowledgeable in it, or they chalk it up to type two diabetes, which is again, very different. And in a type two, your, your body still produces insulin. Your, your body just um, treats it differently. And so you might have to, you know, some have to take insulin, some don't and stuff like that, but uh, it's, it's, it's very different. It's something that can be controlled with diet and exercise and stuff like that. Uh, But a type one, it has no, you know, it doesn't matter what you eat or what you do, like your body just you know, your pancreas doesn't work. Nothing you can do yeah. about it. That's tough with kids, man. Trying to balance, you know, not freaking out, but also not playing it too safe and knowing when to take them to the doctor, when just to kind of give them right. a, uh, Advil and, you know, send them to bed. It's, it's well, no I'm like, I'm a, you know, I'm self-employed. Uh, you know, we, we pay for insurance on our own and it's very expensive and doctor's yeah. visits are very expensive. And in general, I just kind of hate doctors and, and the whole yeah. experience. And, uh, and, you know, frankly, to take a kid to the doctor is, is it disrupts our whole day. I mean, basically we got to take a day off to do it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I mean, those are all horrible excuses in hindsight. Uh, you know, nine times out of 10, we take them in and just give them antibiotics and it's done. And so it's like, all right, you know, we don't have to rush this stuff. Um, but obviously in that situation, it was something that, um, you know, I should have heeded my, my wife's, uh, you know, feelings on, uh, yeah. and that's definitely something I've learned, uh, since then it's, yeah. uh, my, my wife has learned to not, uh, raise the, the red flags unless it's, um, and that's just something she's really feeling is, yeah. is like, no, this is serious. And I've learned to say, okay, when she says that we, we act on it, we, we do it. Yeah. Uh, Listen to our wives. A good great. source of discernment right there. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's, you know, God has designed us to work as a, as a team. Yeah. Um, I, I am fortunate enough to have a wife and I'm fortunate enough to have a great wife. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so, um, you know, we are, we are built to, to work as a team and, and feed off of each other like that. There's definitely been times where I've had discern about, about something and said, no, like we really shouldn't do this or we should do this. And, and she's had to lean into that as well. And, uh, and I have, you know, it, it seems to be a lesson I keep learning over and over and over. Um, there's, uh, you know, been been other things that have come up to where I'm just like, ah, really, do we have to do that? And, it, you know, it always ends up that she's right. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, was a big, uh, obviously a big moment in our lives and uh, something we've, we've all learned from uh, since then. But. Yeah, very cool. So I want to talk, um, you have your your Sunday group ministry and, and uh, business and talking about Sunday to Sunday, you know, um, our pastor had a recent sermon too, you know, less about Sunday, more about Monday, helping churches engage in uh, ministry all week long and not just the hour, two hours on Sunday. Yeah. So I want to ask you, how can churches engage their congregation all week long? What are some good ways that you've seen it done? And also what advice do you have for any church leadership uh, listening to this in this day and age of changing strategies, you know, AKA COVID. Yeah. I mean, you know, one, one thing I loved about uh, the church I attend a uh, small little church here in Georgia, maybe 300 people uh, pre COVID. And, uh, but one thing, you know, we had to close just like anybody else. And uh, our pastors quickly jumped on to social media to say, well, we're, we're here. Uh, you know, we're going to be more active on social media we're going to engage with you guys here. And, uh, and it was great for three or four months. Uh, we had that connection to them. They would, uh, the senior pastor would go live from his house and do 
um, the sermons there, uh, but not only just Sunday, but throughout the week, he would just go live almost every day with, with new little nuggets, devotionals. Uh, he would just chat about stuff. He would share about current culture stuff. Uh, it was great. We had a, a great connection and he would reply in the comments and we'd be mm. able to, to engage with them that way. And then the worship pastor from his house would do uh, little worship sessions. Yeah. Um, you know, the other guys uh, on the team uh, as well would do things. The children's uh, director, she would get on and, and uh, do lessons for the kids. It was just, it was really great. They were, they were great to jump in, create content, kind of get involved in our lives. Cause you know, we weren't doing community groups at the time either. We weren't doing Sunday mornings. And so they really just leaned into social media to, to engage with people that way. And, and it was, it was really great. Um, and I think any church can do that. I mean, again, we're a small little church, three or four people on staff mm-hmm. and uh, you know, they just did it with their phones. They didn't have any fancy equipment at home or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but it helped us stay connected. Uh, they were very uh, uh, interested in people's needs. Um, and, you know, in fact, all of them followed up either by phone or email uh, with pretty much everyone in the church that they were able to get a hold of and, and just really say, you know, we're praying for you. And, and what are your needs? Like literally, do you need toilet paper? Do you need money? Do you need this? Yeah. Um, I thought that was really great. I think that any church could, could do that of, of any size. Um, what I, what I want to see though, is, is churches continue to do that. I mean, even, yeah. even our church has, has uh, they don't do that as much now that we're reopened Um you know, we're, we're reopened under, you know, certain conditions, but they're, they're meeting Sunday, you know, every Sunday uh, and community groups are starting to meet in homes and stuff like that. And so uh, to me, it's like, man, that was such a great opportunity though, to, to stay connected to people. Um, you know, people saw that it was, you know, church isn't going to stop no matter what. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it's important to keep that up. Um, I think that that's just as important as a, as a Sunday morning, particularly because, I mean, there's a lot of families like us that are still in that situation where we're not really attending every Sunday. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got four kids. Uh, our guy preaches for over an hour. Like I'm not Mm going to go, uh, sit through a church service for two hours with all of our masks on. We, we would take up a whole row, which means the row in front of us and the row behind us is, is not occupied. Um, and then there's no real meet and greet or fellowship in the halls anymore. Cause it's just like, get out and let the next yeah. service come in. And, uh, hopefully you don't need to use the restroom because that's a whole different experience there too, you know, with one or two people at a time. It's mm-hmm. just for us, it's like, man, it, you know, as selfish as it sounds, it's not, it's not a great experience. And, and so, uh, we just aren't really doing it right now. Like we'll, we'll attend again when, when things are, are really back to normal. Um, and I think a lot of people are in that same boat. Like we're still connected. We're still tithing. We're still very well known. We're still in connection with everyone. We're still in community with people. Um, you know, we're very much a part of the church still, but it's, it's, you know, I wish that there was a a better connection online. I think social media is a great opportunity for churches to do that. I think churches can lean into their websites. They can lean into YouTube. They can lean into email and very, you know, in particular, social media just has a huge opportunity through groups uh, as well, through content that you can put out. Um, You can stay connected with anyone in the world, reach a a wide audience through social media. And so, I mean, that's, that's a lot of what we push is to continue to do that. And it really, it really is more than just putting out content or promotional stuff or uh, posting cute graphics and things like that. That's like, that's some of the stuff you can do, but it, what we really talk about is no, this is a platform. Um, these are all digital opportunities where you can actually create disciples. Yeah. And that's by building relationships with people. That's engaging back and forth, getting to know people where they're at and not forcing everyone to come to Sunday. It seems so many churches uh, are just, everything they do online is all about come to Sunday, come to Sunday. And then when you get there on Sunday, yeah, you're going to hear a great message. You're going to hear some good music and you might wave to a few people, but that's it. There's no real opportunity on Sunday for growth and discipleship making right. other than hearing the teaching. And so we're just missing a huge opportunity to do that from Sunday to Sunday yeah. throughout the week. Um, and I think there's a ton of different ways you can do that. And this year has really pushed churches to do the online stuff that they were kind of maybe dragging their heels on. You know, I know our church, you know, we weren't live streaming on Sunday and like, look, here we are now live streaming. And (laughs) it's really caused a lot of churches to kind of rethink their social media strategy, which I think is good because you think about all the younger 
generation specifically, they get online, they get a daily message from some influencer, Christian or not. They get some kind of daily content, whether it's on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook, they're constantly getting info and, and, and persuading them in one way or another. And so the church that only gives a message once a, a week, yeah. you know, I think is missing an opportunity where instead of hearing something from your favorite influencer, you hear it from a pastor who knows you, who has a connection with you and yeah. who can follow up with you on a, a, a chat voicemail or, or, or phone call after. Yeah. Um, and so that doesn't mean they have to post every day. But I think like you're saying is be more intentional about what the content you're putting out there? Is it connecting with your audience? Is it something that can propel them through the week when they may be struggling, when they may be, you know, having a hard time to make it to Sunday? Well, yeah. maybe they need something on a Wednesday that kind of gets them into the word, gets them into prayer, something like that. And I think, you know, when you think about everybody is online, I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're talking from kids to, to adults to elderly, uh, everybody's online in, in one way or another, for the most part, right? You know, 99% of people. Sure. And, uh, and we are consuming a lot, we're consuming a lot of things that are shaping our viewpoints on everything. Uh, we're going to the internet for, for help on everything from how to change a taillight to um, how to read the Bible or yeah. um, how to, to help with the decision over an, um, an abortion or your sexual identity or, you know, anything. And we're consuming all of that content in, in a number of different ways, but none of it is an hour long teaching session or, or lecture. I mean, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know any other, other than like watching a movie Right. I don't know of any other content that I consume that shapes what I believe and, and answers questions other than Sunday sermons, uh, you know, that are, that are that long or that, you know, one way. And so there's, I feel like there's just so many more opportunities for the church to just be ingrained in all of those different channels in different little bite-sized ways that can influence people in probably a more powerful way than a sermon or at least just as powerful. Um, so you, you know, you'll see pastors who are online, but they're, they're not approachable. I mean, you know, 99, probably, you know, 900 out of a thousand pastors who are online, they're, they're just posting stuff and they're, you know, posting clips and things like that, but they're not, you can't engage with them. You, you ask them a question or reply to a tweet and it just goes nowhere or it goes to their staff. Um, very few you know, pastors are actually engaging back and forth with people. And I think that that's a really big missed opportunity. I think your whole staff can be on mm. board and, uh, and online and, and engaging with people. I think there's a huge opportunity there. I think you can, you can put out smaller videos. Uh, you can put out TikToks. You can put out, you know, all yeah. sorts of stuff uh, that can be helpful. You know, churches are posting their 30 hour long minute sermons on YouTube and saying, we're on YouTube. It's like, no one's watching that. Have you ever right. watched a YouTube video? They're yeah. not, they're not 30 minutes long. Right. Like spice that up, uh, if anything, but yeah. instead, how about create content specifically for YouTube? Yeah. Um, you know, not, you know, most of the videos on YouTube, most of the searches on YouTube start with the words, how to mm. people go to YouTube for anything you know, how to change a, a taillight, how to restart my iPhone, yeah. how to read the Bible, how to do this, like start targeting that kind of content with uh, uh, searches with, you know, content that can answer that. Yeah. Um, because people are answering those questions, but it's, you know, it's 17 year old uh, influencers and <laughs> uh, the Mormon church and stuff like right. that. Like, you know, we need to be there too. Yeah. Amen to that. So speaking of engagement, uh, you know, apart from church leadership, you know, they, they say that, you know, before COVID that 20% of the people would do 80% of the work in the church. And it's really hard to get people to volunteer, to participate, to do more than show up on Sunday, I think for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, and we become a consumer culture where like we're talking about people consume all the content that's available. They just take it in, you know, they, they might grow in their knowledge, but as a, what, what would you say to people who go to church, who, who listen to this stuff, how they can maybe give back a little bit, how they can I- engage in what churches are doing and, and be a part of something instead of just kind of showing up? Yeah, I think uh, just like 
anything the church does it's it's always it's always the same like you know our model is uh, a sermon a couple songs put your kids in kids ministry and then go home and that's the only yeah. thing we do everything revolves around sunday morning and so all of the volunteer opportunities are also geared around sunday morning you, you can either greet at the door which is great but whatever yeah you can uh work in kids ministry and and by the way we really really need people in kids ministry it's <laughs> always a huge need yes and uh or you know uh if you're if you're a member and a deacon you can uh you know hold the offering plate and, uh, and that's about it, it you know like it, it just right. comes down to to those types of positions and so there's guys like me that uh serve at church and it's like all right you know i'll, I'll greet i can be charismatic that's that's fine um, you know, I, you know, we've worked in kids ministry before, but it's, it's frankly, if it's not my kids, I just don't, I don't want to bother. Like it's the, it's like the worst, uh, position to put me in <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's just, we'll serve because we feel like we want to help. Um, but where I, you know, thrive most is, you know, when the church reaches out and says, Hey, Justin, what's your opinion on, on our new website? What's your opinion on, social media or can you help with social media or this and that and it's i you know i'm fortunate enough to to be a part of a church that does reach out to me for things like that and I, I it's great because i'm like yes this is where i can actually be helpful and use the skills uh, and experience that god has given me to actually help the church i think that's great and so you know with this engaging more from sunday to sunday opens up so many more opportunities for volunteers uh that you don't realize people are just dying to to do and help and they they may not even realize it's even an opportunity most of the time people are like hey this i can actually do this for the church awesome like the 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 woman who helps with social media at our church she's a a, a stay-at-home mom and she does it all from her phone at home or wherever she is Mm. Um, and that's great she does it all volunteer um and, uh, you know, there's no way that she could serve in any other role at the church on Sunday. It's just logistically, you know, doesn't work for her. Uh, but she can now be very, very involved in a huge, impactful way uh, by doing social media. Um, you know, you could have a volunteer take over your email stuff. There's so many, you know, businessmen and leaders and entrepreneurs that, uh, you know, are MailChimp experts that would love to take that over for the church. Um, stuff like that, like make those needs known. Honestly, I think a church should just make a bullet point list of everything that they have to do every day of the week and then make that available and say, you know, what can be, what has to be done by a staff member because of whatever reason yeah, and knock those out. But everything else, it's like, man, if we can find a volunteer to help with this stuff, do it. Like, you know, you should have a team, an army of yeah. uh, volunteers doing all kinds of stuff that they can do from work, they can do from home, yeah. they can do in the evening. Uh, I mean, there's just a hundred different things that volunteers can do. It's just making that stuff known, and then and then really having that mindset of it's okay that a volunteer does this, right. uh, and it doesn't mean that you have to oversee every little aspect of it either. It's not like it's going to add more to you. Well. And I think sometimes there's a roadblock because leadership sometimes waits for people to ask to volunteer and people wait to be asked. And yep. so, you know, yep. never the end shall meet because, well, I guess there's, and you're like, like you're saying, you know, make it known, make it available so that, Hey, these are our needs. This is where you can serve. And then also just jump in because, you know, whether it's the church or your community, there's always a need, whether it's serving at a food bank or yeah. a women's shelter or just helping your neighbor. I mean, Jesus said, if you've done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And so there's no small task in the kingdom of God if it's doing it as unto the Lord. Well, and as you're building relationships with people and engaging with them, you'll know what they're good at and what they do and what their skills are. And so you can go to them and ask, because I don't know how many times I've uh, help churches to where they're like, man, we, you know, we, we put the slide up and we put the posts out and we put it in the bulletin and we say, man, we need this need. We need this need. And no one steps up. But if you go to Carl and you say, Hey, Carl, I saw you're like excellent at Instagram. Like that's, that's cool, man. Would you mind doing that for the church? Cause we've, we've had the social media need that we've been promoting for six, six you know months now and no one stepped up and Carl goes, yeah, I've seen those, but I didn't realize I didn't realize I could do that. I didn't realize, yeah. you know, that was, that was something I could do. So those personal invitations, just like, you know, inviting people to church is yeah. what's going to work better. That's really cool. 
So last question for you on discerning our church environment, I'll say. Uh, so I wrote a Bible plan called Hurt by Christians, which just helps Christians grow past the hurt and sometimes the pain that we feel from other Christians who should be looking like Jesus. But a lot of times we're all guilty of sin and, and ways and things we say that are not like Jesus. And so, you know, I think just about every Christian who's been in church for a good amount of time has experienced some type of hurt or uh, been offended by something in the church. And so what would you say to Christians who who may have been hurt or that tend to look at other Christians as needing to be like Jesus. But a lot of times we, we, we realize that we're all human and, and need the grace of our savior. Yeah. I mean, that's a hard one. I've, I've dealt with that a lot with the experience of Mars Hill um, church. I mean, obviously a lot of people feel like they were hurt by Mars Hill. I mean, the, the you know, the, the church closed, the, the pastor, uh, resign. There was a lot of conflict, you know, and things, and things around that, that people can, can Google and look up if they don't know what we're talking about. But yeah. um, there are still people to this day. I mean, this is six years later that say they just, they, they're still Christians, but they don't really go to church anymore. They were, they've been hurt by the church and yeah. uh, I don't really trust the church because of their one experience um, or even just the perceived experience that they've, they've read about. Um and so that's, that's hard. I mean, it, for me, it's just like, come on, like, if you're, if you're really a Christian, you know, you listen to that, that pull of the Holy Spirit to, to be a part of community some way, like you don't have to do church the traditional way. If you don't want to, I'm, I'm all on board with that. Like there's a, you know, a hundred different ways to do church and be a part of a church. That's, you know, figure out one that, uh, that works for you and, and your family. Um, and so I don't know, for me, it's, it's like, man, like, how can you ignore that? I mean, that's, that's where you've got to use that discernment as a Christian or as a family member to say, yeah, you know, I'm going to do, uh, the right thing and, uh, and be in community with others, uh, no matter what the past hurt is. And so, you know, as, as church, as the church and pastors, how we can help on our side with that is to, um, is to try and come alongside them in, in different ways and to, to not force our uh, traditional ways on it to say, okay, the, you know, this person was hurt by a church in the past. So it's a struggle for them to just show up on Sunday to a new church. Yeah. How about uh, for them? I offer to meet with them once a week uh, for coffee and uh, I'll share the gospel with them each time. I'll talk about, um, things that God has put on my heart to share with them. And that can be our church for a while until they earn that trust back and, mm. and come on Sundays or become part of a community group or That's something, good. or to be okay with the fact that some people just go to community group and they don't show up on Sundays. Um, yeah. You know, as long as they're in community and, and known and, and they're, they're absorbing Bible teaching uh, and they're growing as a Christian, I don't care, you know, how you, yeah. how you do all the things that we offer. And it, you know, especially in today's culture, it's so easy to be offended by everything. And even in the church, you know, the, the, the how loud the worship is, you know, the type of yeah. preaching, the, the, I mean, the color of the walls, I mean, you name it, people can get offended about all kinds of things, but we have to remember too, as Christians that we're called to love first and taking an offense means that we take it, we pick it up. No one can make you be offended by something. And so if we walk in love and the grace that God gives us for other people, even if they may deserve our offense or our hate, that doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that I mean, that definitely means that we don't need to give that to them, that we can love them in spite of it. That doesn't mean we have to sign up to get hurt. That doesn't mean we even have to go to a church that is doing the wrong things. It just means that we're in control of our relationship with Christ. And that should, out of that should overflow into the love and abundance that he gives us. Yeah, for sure. Cool, man. Well, that was a great conversation. Thanks for coming on. Just let everyone know where they can uh, connect with you. Yeah, thanks again for having me, Tim. Uh, this was definitely uh, a pleasure. Hope, hope you know, even a, a bit of it is helpful for someone. Um, and uh, that's why I continue to do these things. Um, if people want to learn more about what I do and, and the things that we offer, they can go to sundaytosunday.com. So Sunday, T-O, Sunday.com. That lists everything that, that we offer from the conference to subscription sites. And then uh, we also give away a ton for free. So you can, you can sign up as a Sunday Insider uh, for free. And we give you, um, all sorts of stuff every month uh, that helps your church 
um, you know, again, we do this to, to help churches and uh, we try to try to do so um, in a way that's cost effective for, for pretty much everyone. Awesome. Nothing better than free. So I'll put those yeah. in the show notes and everyone check that well, out. Thank and thanks again, Justin, for coming on. God bless you and your family. You too. Thank you for listening to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. For more information on Discerning Dad, go to discerning-dad.com. Be sure to follow on all the social media platforms. Just search for Discerning Dad. Please share this podcast with a friend and leave an honest review on whichever platform you listen. Feel free to send any comments, suggestions, questions, or prayer requests at discerningdad at outlook.com. Until next time. Keep fighting the good fight.